The goal of basic and advanced life support is to save lives. Yet we know we are not doing as well as we would like. The average survival from out-of-hospital cardiac arrest is only 6.4% for adults and 5 to 12% for children. Survival from in-hospital cardiac arrest is slightly higher, averaging 20% for adults and 27% for children. Two studies published in 2005 gave us sobering evidence about the quality of CPR performed by healthcare providers. Rescuers provided compressions that were too shallow or they interrupted compressions too often. These studies led us to revise the way we teach CPR. You'll see that CPR is not just a stopgap measure to be used until you can begin advanced life support. In fact, immediate bystander CPR can double or triple survival from out of hospital sudden cardiac arrest. High quality CPR does make a difference. The foundation of pediatric advanced life support is high quality basic life support. During CPR, you should concentrate on the following key points. Pushing hard and pushing fast. Allowing complete chest recoil. Minimizing interruptions in chest compression. Avoiding hyperventilation. The importance of providing high quality chest compressions is emphasized throughout the 2005 guidelines. Chest compressions are important because they maintain a small but critical amount of blood flow to vital organs, such as the brain and the heart. The better the chest compressions are performed, the more blood flow they generate. Chest compressions that are too shallow or too slow do not generate enough blood flow. One indicator of the effectiveness of chest compressions is the coronary perfusion pressure. This pressure is the difference between the aortic and diastolic pressure the bottom of the purple line, and the right atrial end diastolic pressure, the yellow line. The higher the coronary perfusion pressure during CPR, the better the victim's chance of survival. If the coronary perfusion pressure is too low, the patient won't survive. Here you see pressure measurements recorded during actual CPR in a laboratory. The difference between the bottom of the purple lines and the bottom of the yellow lines reflects coronary perfusion pressure. As you can see, by the end of a series of compressions, the coronary perfusion pressure is adequate. However, every time compressions are interrupted to give breaths, blood flow stops, and coronary perfusion pressure falls dramatically and remains low as long as compressions are interrupted. When chest compressions resume, it takes several compressions to restore coronary perfusion pressure and thus blood flow to the heart to the level it was before the interruption. Remember, when chest compressions are stopped, blood flow to the heart and brain stops and drugs will not circulate. As you just saw, the more interruptions in chest compressions, the lower the coronary perfusion pressure, and we know that lowers the victim's chances of survival. When you are giving compressions, it is also important that you let the chest recoil completely after each compression. If you don't allow complete chest recoil, the heart won't refill with blood and your next compression will generate less blood flow. So, now that you understand the importance of high quality chest compressions, you might be wondering about the role of ventilations in CPR. After all, most pediatric cardiac arrests are secondary to shock or respiratory failure and the victims are hypoxemic and hypercarbic before arrest. However, during cardiac arrests, the child victim doesn't need much ventilation. High quality chest compressions provide about 25 to 33% of normal cardiac output. To match ventilation to perfusion, experts think that optimal minute ventilation is only about 25 to 33% of normal. Any additional breaths are unnecessary. They may actually be harmful. If you give too many breaths during CPR, you reduce the blood flow generated by the chest compressions because ventilations create positive pressure in the chest and prevent the heart from refilling with blood. You also reduce blood flow when you interrupt chest compressions to give the breaths, unless an endotracheal tube or tracheotomy tube is in place. In order to minimize interruptions in chest compressions, yet still provide adequate ventilation during CPR, Lone rescuers of infants, children, and adults should use a 30 to 2 compression to ventilation ratio. 
Two healthcare providers should use a 15 to 2 ratio for infants and for children up to the age of puberty. This ratio does not apply to newly borns. Deliver rescue breaths over one second with a volume to just make the chest rise. For respiratory arrest with a pulse, give rescue breathing at a rate of 12 to 20 breaths per minute for infants and children. When you provide bag mask ventilation during two-person CPR, you cycle breaths with compressions in a 15 to 2 ratio. Once an advanced airway is in place during CPR, compressions are continuous, and you give 8 to 10 ventilations per minute for all ages except newly borns. Now, how do we incorporate defibrillation into the new guidelines? You know that in the pre-hospital setting, sudden VF cardiac arrest is uncommon in children. It may surprise you to know that data from the National Registry of CPR shows that one in four children who arrest in the hospital have a shockable rhythm at some point in the resuscitation. Therefore, you need to be proficient in performing defibrillation during resuscitation. We've known for quite some time that the longer the interval between VF arrest and attempted defibrillation, the lower the survival rate. When no bystander CPR is provided, survival falls 7 to 10 percent for every minute of delay in defibrillation, as shown here. Bystander CPR increases survival at any interval to defibrillation. This evidence was the impetus for the development of community lay rescuer AED programs. With these programs, bystanders who are present during the first few minutes of an arrest can provide both CPR and early defibrillation. You will attach a defibrillator as soon as it is available for a child who collapses suddenly in the pre-hospital setting and for cardiac arrest in the hospital. EMS medical system directors may instruct EMS providers to give two minutes of CPR prior to defibrillation for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest when the system call to arrival time is more than five minutes. The biggest change made in the 2005 guidelines for attempted defibrillation is the recommendation to use single shocks followed by immediate CPR. Single shocks are recommended because biphasic defibrillators have a 90% first shock success rate for VF of short duration. If the shock does eliminate the VF, the post-shock rhythm is typically a systole or pulseless electrical activity. The patient will need CPR until a perfusing rhythm resumes. If VF is not eliminated with one shock, the heart is likely to be ischemic, and immediate, high-quality chest compressions are needed to deliver blood flow and oxygen to the heart before you attempt the next shock. In a recent study of post-shock rhythms in adult patients with VF, none had a perfusing rhythm immediately after shock delivery. For these reasons, you should not look for a pulse or check the rhythm right after shock delivery. Instead, you should immediately resume CPR, beginning with compressions.